What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Letterman Row. This is Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by our good friends at Buyers Automotive. If you're looking for an auto, go to Buyers Auto. That's what they say. Uh, it's a great spot to get a car. Great people over there. Spencer Holbrook on the other side with me. I'm Jeremy Birmingham. Um, Spencer, it's been a few days since Ohio State got a commitment, so everyone can probably everyone's probably starting to freak out a little bit. Um, the Buckeyes did, since the last time we spoke uh, on this show, uh, add their first two 2022 commitments from defensive back Jair Brown out of New Orleans and then Ohio offensive lineman Tegra Tashibola. Um, and just like that, the 2022 class, which we've been kind of waiting to see when it would, you know, bubble up, is now officially off and running. If you're looking into the early rankings, which you shouldn't be, uh, the Buckeyes have now the second-ranked class in the 2022 class with those two commitments of uh, trailing LSU, who has four. Um, but as per usual, the Buckeyes are off to a great start. And I think Jair Brown is an interesting kid, man. I had such a good time interviewing him uh, on the episode of Permanology when he committed. And it's so rare for the Buckeyes to go down to New Orleans and to Louisiana even if the kid's from Ohio, it's a big win for Kerry Combs. Yeah, it is a huge win. And, and they don't seem to be done down there. There's a couple other guys that Jair Brown's going to try and go after. Uh, it's going to be an interesting cycle from that perspective because, like you said, what is it, two guys since 2000? Like, that's just – it's almost unheard of to um, go down there. There's two, two guys in the last 22 years, but only three now since 1970. So it, it's, it is a very rare area for the Buckeyes to recruit. But, you know, if you can start to open a pipeline any way you can uh, get to the south. And, you know, Ohio State's had some odd ways of opening some recruiting pipelines in the past. And if, a kid, if it takes a kid from Cincinnati to open up the, uh, the Cajun pipeline, I don't think that's a bad thing for the Buckeyes. Yeah, and let's be clear. I mean, Jair Brown is from Ohio, but he only – he moved to Louisiana when he was four, okay? So it's not like he's been there for three years and has been watching. He's grown up in the middle of the SEC renaissance – and the dominance of Alabama, LSU, Georgia, Clemson, all the schools in the South that he had offers from. So it is a big win for the Buckeyes. Uh, the Ohio State coaching staff pretty much after failing to land Richard Lawrence back in uh, the 2017 class, pretty much decided they were going to stop recruiting Louisiana. So it, the, the funny thing about J.R. Brown and the way this worked out is he first reached out uh, to Ohio State media members like myself like three, four weeks ago to be like, hey, just so you guys know, I'm interested in Ohio State. Get my name out there if you can. I'm from Ohio. I love the Buckeyes. And we're like, oh, okay, that's weird. And I asked him the first time we talked, I said, have you ever heard from Ohio State? And he said no. And I, at that point, I didn't write about him because I was like, well, I don't need to. I guess he's a 2022 guy and there's not a lot of uh, discussion that should be had around the kid right now. Then he reaches out and says, hey, Coach Combs messaged me, and they're going to offer. And then they offer, and five days later, he's a commit. And it's like, holy crap, that is a, uh, a speedy, speedy resolution. Yeah, but, you know, when you can't visit right now and you can't really get to campus and coaches can't come to you, if you know where you want to go, you know, we've been talking about in the 2021 class, uh, even more so because, you know, that class is starting to fill up. If you know where you want to go, you need to get in. Well, it's no different because – I think one, I think, you know, I can't speak for the kid, but it's probably a good thing for the Buckeyes that he got in the class now because now yeah. it's a lot harder to publicly decommit when LSU starts to put the pressure on you than it is to, to you know, do it in private. So I think it's probably a good thing for Ohio State to get him in the class, accept that, that uh, commitment early on and let him know, yeah. you know, where he stands as the building block of this class because now when LSU comes with the full court press like they do with all those guys down south, it's going to be a lot harder for him to, to walk away. Yeah, and, you know, Ohio State obviously right now has five defensive backs committed in 2021, looking to add a sixth at some point. The numbers for the 2022 class are pretty much up in the air. You don't know right now how many defensive backs they're going to look to in that class. So for a guy like Jair Brown to get the offer now and say I'm in now kind of changes the way they recruit that position moving forward for the entire cycle of 2022. Um Similarly, Tegra Teshabola, with his commitment, the offensive lineman from Lakota West High School down in Westchester, Ohio, this is a kid that 
It has been offered by Ohio State uh, since last November. Everyone kind of just knew eventually he was going to pull the trigger and commit to Ohio State. I just think it's fascinating to see the impact, and you very rarely get an opportunity to see how recruiting dominoes work this quickly. But once someone else is in, once that class is underway, and you start to realize, okay, now I, there's a little pressure off of me from being the first guy. Now you see Tiger Teshabola jump in the class, and you know he visited Tennessee. He's very interested in the volunteers, a couple other schools. Everyone knew he was going to end up at Ohio State from the minute he got the offer. Now the question is, with C.J. Hicks from, from Dayton Archbishop Alter High School, um, and then with Gabe Powers, and then – you start to wonder what happens. Blake Miller from the offensive lineman at Strongsville uh, 2022 just offered by the Buckeyes on Friday. Now well, these guys – go ahead. It, it's an interesting thing because, you know, we talk about this numbers game all the time. Well, Ohio State's on an absolute tear in 2021. So if they need to expand the numbers and, and get a little creative in the numbers game to get two or three more guys into that 2021 class, they're going to because they're not going to just give up on the momentum they've created. And they'll right. let that boil over into 2022. Once you get three or four guys committed in the 2022 class, everyone around the country that wants to play at Ohio State says, okay, they've got 19 more spots left. If I'm going to be one of those 19, I need to get in. And that's not pressure from the coaching staff. That's just simple uh, arithmetic, simple right? Yeah. It's simple math. Like, if you want to get into class, you need to get in now because once you commit, then there's only 18 more spots and there's 17. You know, it fills up a lot, a lot quicker than people think. And so, like, the 2021 class is a great example of that, where these guys just continue to commit because they need their spot in the, in the class. And I think the 2022 class, if it continues to do this, that's how Ohio State might recruit just moving forward. Hey, if you want in, we're not going to force you to get in, but we're also not going to stop recruiting. So if you want in, you know, there's, there's spots, but they're filling up quickly. If 95% of the prospects that you're recruiting are top 100, top 150 type players, it's not a big deal if one gets in and you want, and another one gets out and, and, and is left out. I mean, there's only so many spots. Ohio State is recruiting only the best of the best right now. Uh, they are not taking flyers uh, out there. And so I think the interesting thing for me to watch with 2022 is knowing how much of the evaluation period has been lost because of the coronavirus pandemic, how the Buckeyes, um, how willing they are to go out and say, you know what, we've seen enough out of this kid that we'll say yes in the 2022 class. That's why Tegra Teshabola, and I don't want to gloss over him because he was expected to end up at Ohio State, being that he's from Ohio, because he's a really good player. He's a top 60 player in the country. Um, but it's so very rare for an offensive lineman in the state of Ohio to get an offer from the Buckeyes as early as he did, but then to be able to commit um, without this summer, you know, he's going into his junior year without this summer's camp um, calendar happening, it's pretty interesting to me, and it speaks volumes about the way Ohio State sees his potential. And I don't think it's a coincidence that they immediately then offered Blake Miller from Strongsville the day after because now they say, oh, okay, well, we got one piece of that puzzle. That offensive line group could only be three or four guys. And now you're like, if we can get in these two, and Blake Miller is a – he's only a three-star prospect right now, but I, I – I don't know why. I think there's some current concerns about maybe his ability to hold his weight down. Another kid who's 6'6", 320 um, right now, but he's got big-time offers of Michigan, Penn State, people in the, in the region. Um, he's a guy that is going to end up at Ohio State, barring some major change of heart from the Buckeyes or from him whenever it happens. So it's just very interesting to see that they're – plotting this out, I think, well in advance of saying, if we can get two guys from Ohio in this class, then we can start really, we can wait a year to start evaluating the out-of-state guys because they've had an opportunity to see Blake Miller and to see Tishabola and to see C.J. Hicks and Gabe Powers. They've watched these guys. And now that 2022 class, which for everyone else in the country right now is probably going to start off slow. The Buckeyes are looking at potentially a core of four or five guys that are committed early and they're all going to be from Ohio and, and leading the charge. And I, I think that it's a very smart, calculated uh, approach. And it's the exact same thing that he did in 2021. You get those in-state yep. guys in early, and whenever those guys from out of state are, are able to come visit, you bring those in-state guys on campus, and you just let them talk to them. Because you don't yep. really need the it, – it's more of the student-to-student, the, student, the uh, high schooler to high schooler talking than the coaches to high schoolers 
schooler talk because they talk amongst themselves on, you know, all oh, the coach told me this, the coach told me this. And then you get a sense of where you stand in the program. I think this recruiting strategy is interesting. It's one that I think Ohio State's going to adopt uh, moving forward permanently. I, I just think it's very smart because it obviously worked in the 2020 class when they finished in a pretty strong fashion. Yeah, the, the fifth, 2021 fifth class in the country. The 2021 class is, is, I don't even know, it's actually going to be off the charts because in a literal sense, because it'll be the highest rated class probably ever uh, if all the dominoes fall. Right. And uh, so if, if it's been working, you might as well try it again in 2022 because if it works, don't, don't fix it. Well, you know, you're talking about that, that approach and get the 2021 guys in early and then when the national guys can come visit, then you make the move. And that right now is the big question when it comes to the 2021 class and how it finishes out, not necessarily who the targets are because those guys have been known for a while and it's, it's really the same few players we've talked about for the last year. Um, but now the, the question is, when can they come visit? When are they going to be able to make it? Ohio State has not completely ruled out the June 12th official visit weekend that they've been hoping to put together. They haven't wiped it away yet. But, I mean, if, if we're being honest, it does seem like that weekend may not happen um, as far as on-campus recruiting. So that leaves some major questions in the recruitment of two wide receivers who are both supposed to be on campus for official visits on June 12th. Emeka Abuka and Troy Stellata, who we have talked about ad nauseum in the last year. In the last few days, Spencer, we've noticed a crystal ball run on both of those guys. The crystal balls for Abuka are going to Ohio State, and the crystal balls for Stellato are going to Clemson. It's always been likely that those two split the difference and go one, or the, one goes to one school, one goes to the other. I think that there's been an outside chance for the Buckeyes that they could land them both, and there's an outside chance that Clemson could. But the reality was these two were probably going to end up at uh, different schools out of those two. Ohio State wants them both very clearly. But I think that if you look at the construction of the Ohio State roster right now, they need probably two or three more wide receivers to leave after this next year to even fit in the three receivers that they're trying to sign in 2021 with Jaden Ballard, Marvin Harrison, and then either Abuka or Stilato, because there is no seniors on the roster at wide receiver. So is it fair or is it smart, I guess, for the Buckeyes at this point to just say, whichever one of you guys wants in first, whichever one of you thinks you're ready, the other one we're just going to have to walk away from. I think that's the, that's the play, right? If you want both of them, but you can only take one, well, I, it's almost like not beggars can't be choosers because Ohio State's not going to beg for anything from, these, from recruits. Right. But, I mean, at the same time, if you want both of these guys, you know, you're, and you can only get one, you better accept a commit from at least one of them. Because if, yeah. if you don't commit, accept a commit from one of them, you're not going to get either. So I, I think and it's just a smart play to just go ahead and accept one whenever they're ready. And the thing is, you just don't know – what that timeline is. Again, if those June visits get canceled, and I think that the, the, the big picture goal here has been get to June visits and then decide. Let them kind of, it, similar to what happened with the running backs in, in early March. They had an opportunity to see Donovan Edwards and they told him then, hey, you want in, you're our guy. If you, if you can't say that, we're going to keep recruiting elsewhere and then whatever happens, happens. We saw what ended up happening three weeks later. Travion Henderson and Evan Pryor were both committed to Ohio State. And Donovan Edwards is, is not really in the picture anymore. There is a huge gap between the rankings of Abuka and Stellato. Ohio State does not care about that. Okay? Like, in, in the Buckeyes' mind, Troy Stellato, who they've recruited very hard for a year, is a player that is really good and the player they want in their program. Emeka Abuka is also on that level. So it's like right now, Stilato has been on the record saying he doesn't plan on committing anywhere until he gets back to Ohio State. If that doesn't happen in June, I don't think he's actually going to wait until September or November to commit. I don't think that Emeka Abuka is going to want to wait that long either. His, his holdup from what I've been able to gather is really just getting his father on campus in Columbus. 
His dad is a guy who's really into the academic side of college and wants a Mecca from what I've been told, uh, really kind of wants him to stay closer to home and end up going to Stanford. Like that's where he wants him to go. So there's, there's all these moving parts, but I think that the reality is that Buckeyes fans should be understanding that one of these two is probably the limit right now and not to be realistically expecting both. Um, well, go ahead. Well, I, I, I think there's a way Ohio State could work the roster to get both of these guys in if they absolutely needed to. Sure. I mean, you said there was no seniors. I don't – I think – I don't want to step over my bouncer. I think Jalen Harris is a senior. Is he? Well, he was I think in he, 2016 class. 16 so, yeah, I guess he, I Jalen guess he Harris, was a senior. So, Jalen Harris is a senior, and I, it would be really hard for me to see Chris Olave – in, in the fourth year at Ohio State. Right. So, the, so there's your two, right? Those, two. They're, they're, there's your two. So you replace those two with the two that are committed. So, and then you have to free up space for one more, which would be easy, just right. by attrition of the roster. Sure, sure, sure. You're not, they don't really ask anybody to leave, but attrition of the roster says a couple guys are going to enter the portal, a couple guys are going to get transfer, right. you know, grad transfer, whatever. So if you absolutely had to, you could certainly get one in. But getting two into this class might be a little difficult, especially when, you know, I mean, let's just think about it this way. Like Wyatt Davis, Josh Myers, Stayer Munford, all going to be gone after next year. You have to replace a lot on the offensive line. A lot on the defensive line is going to be gone if, if you know, this defensive line can stay dominant. You've got other positions of need where, okay, we would love to have these two wide receivers in because they're so talented. But if we have to choose between taking another wide receiver – with our fourth spot tackle. or another tackle or defensive tackle or defensive end, or even another cornerback, because that's a, a you know, a, a turnover, sure. say, a turnover heavy spot. If you get the pun there, uh, you, you got, <laughs> you've got to, you've got to kind of weigh where you're going to go with these last few spots. And I think that's going to be an interesting thing to watch moving forward for Ohio state, not to open that can of worms, but this wide receiver group could, could determine a lot of what they do at other positions. Yeah, I, I think, and I, I, I've been on the record, I, I've thought long and for a while that Troy Stilato, if he got back to Ohio State, which is what I said in, in March, if he got back to Ohio State, that he'll commit to Ohio State. I, I, I don't know that I don't believe that, but I think the way things are trending, to me it looks more like he's not going to get back to Ohio State anytime in the next few months because of the, the COVID-19. And so in that way, I think it's very likely if I had a, a crystal ball still on 247 Sports, I would move my crystal ball on Stellato to Clemson. And I, he's been there. His two most uh, recent college visits have been to Clemson. I don't see any opportunity for him to get back to Ohio State anytime in the very near future to, to sort of uh, stem that, that tide. I think that Troy uh, is a smart kid and, and does understand – the, the roster situation, and he sees these crystal balls coming in for a Mecca Buka, who I've been told very clearly Ohio State is the leader. It, it, you know, Clemson has two receivers. Ohio State has two receivers committed. I just think that the, the way this is shake, shaking out is they both end up with three commits at the position, and a Buka ends up at Ohio State, and Stellato ends up at Clemson. That's just what I see. Now, we're talking about kids who can't visit Ohio State, and you just wonder how it's impacting their ability to recruit them. And that brings me to Javari Ritzy, who Austin and I went and saw um, in early uh, March before the, the coronavirus thing started. Javari Ritzy dropped his top five schools on Sunday. The Buckeyes are the only school, and if it's not, you know, a, a southern delicacy, basically. And, uh, I mean, if he doesn't visit, it's incredibly hard for the Buckeyes to get into that picture it really just depends now on how long he wants to wait to come in. And I think he's a perfect fit for Ohio State. I think that kid – I have a very high opinion of Javari Ritzy as a player, uh, as a person from meeting him. The one time we met in person, he seemed like a kid who would fit perfectly with what the Buckeyes do. But I just don't see how it works out um, in this instance. The Buckeyes have four defensive linemen committed – and or sorry, three defensive linemen committed, and now you start to wonder how it plays out with JT Tuamalo, Marcus Bradley, Ritzy, uh, Damian, Rob of, Damian Robinson, yeah, even who's committed to Maryland. 
you just don't know. I and mean, we saw Landon Jackson from our Texarkana, um, Texas commit to LSU on Sunday. So that one's off the board now as well. But I just think to me, Javari Ritzy, if he was a kid that was from Ohio or had gotten a chance to visit earlier, he to me seems like a, a, a perfect fit for Ohio State. And I don't know that he'll get the chance to be because of the coronavirus thing. But, um, you know, the Buckeyes are in the mix, but I wouldn't be confident if I was, uh, uh, you know, trying to predict where he ends up. Well, and it's it's might end up being one of those battles we've talked about a little bit now, and I think we should probably dive into a little more as this thing continues to go on. This might be a cycle where you see a lot more guys stay closer to home. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if Javari Ritzy can't get on campus – and then he also can get to North Carolina and sees what Mac Brown's doing in North Carolina. That might be a perfect spot for him. You know, he, he's well, also closer to yeah. he's closer to Tennessee. He's closer to South Carolina. There are just other schools he's closer to. Where if he can't get to Ohio State, it's nobody's fault. You know, you right. can't fault the Buckeyes for not being able to recruit him if he can't get to campus, yeah. and you can't fault him for not choosing the Buckeyes if he can't get to campus. So uh, it might just be one of those uh, unlucky things where in any other cycle in the history of ever. <laughs> You know, he, he might be a Buckeye, but, but in this class, it just might not work out. Yeah, the, the two things in Ohio State's favor here, traditionally those North Carolina defensive linemen, I, I, don't, I don't want to say traditionally, but in the last few years anyway, like Desmond Evans, um, even uh, Jaden McKenzie, guys like that have waited um, later in the process uh, to, to make their decision. And the Buckeyes got one last year with Jacoby Cowan. They got Jaden McKenzie before that. They got Tyreek, uh, Tyquan Lewis before that. So they've done well in that area. These kids are, are, are kids who typically wait a little bit longer in the process. North Carolina signed six defensive linemen in the 2020 class. So there are a loaded group too. It was not a, it was not a three and two star group. It was a really good group. It, It was a really good group of kids. And, um, you know, North Carolina has momentum right now. They're the number two recruiting class in the country in the class of 2020. That's not going to last. Um, I think they'll finish with a top 10 class, but that yeah, two class will not, will not. I agree. Not They're going to finish. This is going to be one of their best recruiting finishes in history. But um, once you go out and if you're not winning 10 games, a lot of these kids, similar to Maryland, similar to even remarkably to put them in the same conversation, USC, as we talked about, like if you go out, and USC only wins seven games and Clay Helton gets fired, that class they're putting together is going to wash apart. If North Carolina is a mediocre, middle-of-the-road ACC team, some of these kids, if they have opportunities to visit elsewhere and opportunities to go elsewhere, may do that. Damian Robinson in Maryland, if they go out and win four games, all of the, you know, do-it-for-your-city talk aside, like Chase Young and Dwayne Haskins had no problem doing it for their city in Columbus and then going back home and you know, now doing it for their city in the NFL. So there's, <laughs> there, there's ways to do that. Um, but I think that right now, for most people in the class of 2021, that the Buckeyes are still recruiting, like Tuamalo, like Jabari Ritzy, like Emeka Abuka. These kids who are from far away, like the thing is how do they get on campus? And if they don't get on campus, how likely are they as a person to do what Travion Henderson did and said, you know what, I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to see it. Emeka Abuka has been on campus twice with Ohio State in the past. The Ritzy, Tuamalo have not. So that you have to wonder, like, those odds certainly don't help them, or the, that it, fact doesn't help their odds. It's interesting because three months ago, I would have told you that that Jack Sawyer and uh, Kyle McCord were still the two most important pieces in the recruiting class because they set the, you know they laid the, the foundation for what this class was going to be. Now, if you were to ask me who the most important member of this class is, I think it's Travion Henderson because everything else for the rest of the class, at least until, you know, we can go outside again and people yeah. can start traveling again. Travion Henderson is what the Ohio State coaching staff is going to point to as like, this guy trusts us as a five-star running back enough to commit without visiting. Are yeah. you, you know, not saying they're going to pressure these guys, but you know, are these kids willing to, to take that, that leap of faith almost to, to put, a commitment on Twitter and say, I'm committed to this school without even visiting. Yeah. I I think that's an interesting point. Yeah. It set the tone for what you could see as the new normal for the 2021 cycle, which is kids understanding that the power of what Ohio state is, uh, you're not really, 
being there for a, a campus visit isn't going to show you anything that you're not getting on a on a Zoom call where they take you around to different people. Because again, as we've talked about on the show and others, like you don't go to Ohio State as a football player to sit in the Oval. You know what I mean? Like you don't go there to hang out at Mirror Lake. Like you don't do that. So you go there to be developed for the NFL and to take it to the next level. And to, get an internship, thing, and to get an internship at Nike, you know, you don't have to right. sit on the, on the, at Mirror Lake and study in the books to, to get the internship at Nike. If you're an Ohio State football player, you've got real life Wednesdays, you've got your academic tutors, you've got everything you need inside the building. Right. And they're, they're, those kids are getting those presentations now. They're meeting those people now. The question is, are the parents comfortable with their kids going there? When you're talking about a four and a half hour plane ride from Seattle, um, if Emeka Abuka decided to commit to Ohio State in the near future, which I don't believe is happening, and I want to be very clear, I know the crystal ball run is happening, and as I said, I would, I would predict that he's going to end up there, but I don't think it's happening like imminently. But the impact that he could have on the rest of the class, just because of the impact he could have on JT Tuamalo, is unbelievably large especially because those guys are sitting out there in the Pacific Northwest right now, hanging out with Chief Scott and learning all about Ohio State. Anyway. So there's just these, these little pieces of the puzzle that need to um, kind of be figured out over the next four weeks when it comes to what happens on the June 12th weekend. If that weekend goes off as it expects to, I think you're going to see Ohio State's 2021 class have another big time run of commitments, but also, you're going to leave that weekend with a true sense of clarity about what happens in 2021 moving forward. And then a almost full fledged turn and pivot to the 2022 class. But I think that's where we'll end up today, Spencer. So um, do you have anything else? What do you want to talk about? Anything? Uh, I wanted to start to become cautious about one thing. Uh, so we, I have been on the train of Ohio state is going to land, be end up with the number one class in the country. Uh, and it's going to not be particularly close. Um, I'm going to walk back that statement. I'm going to start to remain a little cautious about that. Uh, the more and more I just look at what's going on at Georgia, the more I really think Georgia is going to push Ohio State for this class's crown. Um, if you look at a guy, like, a guy like Amarius, is that his name, Amarius Mims, the, the offensive lineman, just a massive offensive lineman in the top 10. Uh, there's yeah. a couple other guys in that top 10, top 25 that, that if Georgia can add, Georgia will end up with four or five five-star talents, yeah. just, as, just like Ohio State will. And then it comes down to basically who's your three stars, who's your low four stars, because that's really what makes the number one class a number one class. It's not that it's, it is the five stars, but, you know, after the five stars, what, what do you got beyond the, the uh, surface level top tier talent? And I think Georgia is going to rival Ohio State for that. I don't think it's going to be Clemson. I just think – you know, we've been talking the last few weeks. We pivoted to Ohio State's going to end up with a historic number one class. I think it's going to be true. I think Ohio State can set that historical marker. But I think if you're looking at, at another class, it's not going to be Alabama because Alabama is having some struggles of its own. It's not going to be Clemson. I think it's going to be Georgia, and I think Georgia is going to push them really hard. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that before we get out well, of Well, I mean, that is why two months ago when you asked me this the first time about is Ohio State going to finish – number one in this class. I said, I don't think so because no matter how good they are doing right now, we, the way that Georgia and LSU and Clemson and Bama recruit is all very top head or back, back end heavy. So it's all going to happen for them back in, in November and December. Um, while we're talking right now, Kamar Wilcoxon just committed to Tennessee, by the way, um, the safety out of the IMG Academy, who a lot of people thought would end up at Ohio state. Um, as the defensive backs go that the Buckeyes have been pursuing, he was not one of the ones they were really aggressively going after um, in the last few weeks as they're trying to kind of sort things out between guys like Jalen Davies, um, Denzel Burke, Tony Grimes, et cetera. So Kamar Wilcoxon's off the board. He's now committed for the third time, this time to Tennessee, um, the previous two times to Florida. So um, anyway, Spencer Holbrook, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. This has been Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast. Brought to you by Letterman Row and our good friends at Buy Buy Buyers Auto. Whoop, whoop, there you go. Check yeah. it out. Um, go to buyersauto.com. Check out their selection and 
Um, good luck to everyone uh, staying safe. Make sure everyone is taking care of themselves. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Spencer and I will catch you next time on Talking Stuff. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. We got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buckeye Key with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics. We've got you covered here at Letterman Row.